All right, so you started to look at Bitcoin, blockchain, and yep. cryptocurrencies. How did you come across the internet computer? So I came across the internet computer doing, during the, uh, the Genesis launch event. So that was, I believe, May 11, 2021. Mm -hmm. uh, like everybody, the price uh, had caught my attention. I think it opened at maybe like $600 to $700 per token. Um, and, you know, that was, you know, that was a, a, a pretty big billboard for a lot of people. After I saw the price, I, uh, I actually watched, you know, the, uh, the, the Genesis event that they put out. Um, during that event, they gave a technical description of the internet computer. It was very thorough. It was about a three hour, three and a half hour long, uh, uh, event. Most of it was, um, them explaining the, uh, the tech behind it and then the use cases for it. So immediately coming from a, from a tech background, I was able to kind of get a grasp of the implications. And so I was sold, um, maybe too soon because in that moment I began buying ICP token. And as we know, it went from 700 to six to five to four to 300 to 200, all the way down to um, $2 and 82 cent. I rode and built uh, throughout that entire time. Mm -hmm. So that's, you know, that's how I arrived here. So your project is personal Dow. Yep. And can you just share with people tuning in what a decentralized autonomous organization is? Yeah, we can break it down one by one. It's, it's an organization. Um, so, you know, a collection of actors, um, people who, uh, who all work together. It's autonomous, meaning that you don't need an intermediary or some sort of, uh, some sort of overseer in order to facilitate, uh, you know, that the orchestra of work that happens. Everything is autonomous, meaning everything exists in code, is maintenance, and you know the uh, all of the code necessary for the organization to maintenance itself, upgrade itself, iterate through development. All of it is there, and then decentralized refers to um, the fact that um, there is no geographical central uh, location uh, where all of this has to happen. So unlike, uh, you know, you got uh, people who work, uh, Apple HQ, you know, everybody, every, every, everybody is, or not everybody, but the majority of the people who work for Apple are centralized to that area, you know, or there's plenty of other examples, but uh, yeah, essentially a decentralized autonomous organization is a business uh, that, that can be managed by its owners and its owners don't need any intermediary, um, you know, intervening in order to uh, facilitate the management of that organization. It can be done completely autonomously. It's also, or at least my understanding, is it's very democratic with the either users or participants in a DAO being able to vote on various uh, propositions or changes. Yep. Yep. And um, so how does that process work in a typical DAO versus personal DAO? It's pretty much the same across the board. Uh, you know, that's, that's a standard within decentralized autonomous organizations. Um, any changes to the code that, that uh, you know, that the software product consists of, any changes to that code must undergo um, a proposal, any member of that decentralized autonomous organization um, is able to submit a proposal from that point on everybody votes on the proposal all of the uh the other members and um uh, majority rules so if 51 percent vote to adopt the proposal then it's adopted if 51 percent vote to reject the proposal um, then it's rejected. Now, to become a member, uh, in most cases, 
it's permissionless. All you have to do is purchase the token and then stake that token. And you can do that without having to get permission from any any uh, overseer. Um, in the case of personal DAO, uh, the difference there is that it's not permissionless. It's a gated DAO, meaning anybody who wants to um, be a part of that organization, they have to um, receive approval by the governing uh, the governing body of that organization, the members of that organization, of that personal DAO. And then once the members of their personal DAO say, hey, yes, you can be a part of it, um, you know, from that point on, they get to be a part of it, which is necessary in many use cases. Um, there are a lot of communities who need to be able to manage things amongst themselves. So think about people who are geographically bound to a specific area and they want to uh, maintenance a piece of code that services their specific geographical area. You don't want somebody from the other side of the world who is of a completely different you know, environment than you to be able to come in without permission and be able to influence the organization that you all depend on for you all specific use case. So for that reason, I made the decision to make it a gated DAO so that small communities can uh, create uh, these these uh, exclusive organizations that are uh, specific to them, whatever common trait that they share, whether it's a geographical trait or um, whether it's a you know common interest, whatever the case may be. I would say that's the difference. Um, other than that, you know, it's pretty identical to most other ones. Coming back to this concept of personal DAO, it is a essentially a customizable DAO product that is gated. And what are some of the features that I'm not talking about or I've left out and also what sets personal DAO apart from other DAO projects out there? One of the characteristics that is specific to personal DAO is that these are, um, it's a turnkey DAO that's meant to be deployed to the internet in multiple replicas, multiple instances. And by that, I mean, um, for every community that wants one, they get their own DAO. Now, um, as far as appearances go, if I, got, if I have my own DAO for my community and you have one for your community, as far as appearances go, they appear the same and they function the same. The difference is that uh, those are two different digital entities. You know, mine would have one URL that you would visit. Yours would have a different one. Mine would have, you know, all of the data that is, you know, populated within that DAO. It will be saved to its own database. Um, it has its own treasury. And then yours has, you would have your own database and your own treasury. So although they would look the same, um, they would be two completely separate entities. And so um, think of it kind of like a, uh, for lack of a better term, uh, a little bit like a franchise. You can have two different McDonald's. Uh, if one is hit by a meteor, the other one is completely intact. Same with personal DAO. If um, one personal DAO is hit with whatever the digital equivalent of a, of a meteor is, um, the rest of them are completely intact. And that's by design. What that architecture does is it enables, um, it enables more resilience for the ecosystem that we, we intend to build. Other DAO products, they're typically just one. Everybody goes to the same URL. Everybody's uh, data is stored in the, you know, in the same database. Um, and what that does is it creates a huge honeypot that becomes extremely attractive to bad actors. And so what ends up happening is you get these huge hacks uh, wormhole is an example. Um, there was just a hack that affected uh, a few projects in the ICP ecosystem. That's what we aim to avoid. We don't want to, you know, we don't want to want to create something that that has these vulnerabilities 
where, you know, essentially the bigger it gets and the more popular it gets, the more attractive it is to steal from it. That's what we aim to avoid. Rather than creating something with that architecture, um, we chose to uh, go at a different route where no single actor could cripple the ecosystem as a whole. Um, maybe, you know, it's, you know, if uh, at worst case scenario, um, you know, if, if one were to be breached through some form of fashion or another, um, it wouldn't affect the rest of them that's in the ecosystem. And so having, having that kind of resilience um, in an ecosystem is necessary if it's going to grow if it's going to survive uh, the attacks that will come, whether it be from government regimes, it may it could come from, um, you know, like I said, bad actors, black hat hacker, hackers. It could come from um, non-hackers who just who just want to uh, who have enough money to uh, conduct carry out a 51 percent attack. These are the things that we want to be able to guard against. And the best way to guard against it isn't by building um, a single big door, uh, as in a case, you know, a, a big door with a big lock on it. Right. Uh, the best way to guard against it is by putting more doors in place mm -hmm. so that if someone is successful at, you know, picking one of the locks, they still have plenty more that they have to get through. Right. So, so no one single point of failure. Exactly. That's, that's the thing. That's the theme here. No single point of failure. Decentralization. Right. That's the goal. And I think there's some other features that Personal DAO is going to be embarking on, um, you know, as you're moving past the testing phases. So what are some of those features that users can look forward to? So thus far, I've described... Um, uh, some of the characteristics, I wouldn't even call them features, right? So the characteristics of, of the product, how it's built and, you know, how it's built to sustain and be resilient. I haven't explained what it's used for. It's used for um, as, a, as a lending institution that is owned, operated, and governed by the users of it. So my vision, my goal is to be able to create a product that um, churches or, uh, you know, small communities, uh, villages, um, you know, small organizations, whatever the case is, entities, they can kickstart their own lending institution that doesn't require some intermediary to come through and, uh, and be the, the person who facilitates dictates yes or no you're able to do finance this way or not that's the use case people um ideally will be able to uh start their own on board whoever they want it could be you know uh, specific to a geographical region it could be specific to um you know common interests whatever the case is they select who they want to onboard to this new lending institution that they kickstart and they conduct lending amongst themselves and what that does is it keeps the money within that community whenever interest is paid out it's paid to somebody who is in that community it's not paid out to some big corporation who you know then uses your money to figure out how they can take more money from you um, it's paid out to the people that you onboard so in my case um, I have two parents, both entrepreneurs. I have five siblings, uh, some of them, uh, four siblings, um, five of us total. Uh, some are entrepreneurs, some are not. Um, I have friends, family. Whenever borrowing happens, whenever they need to borrow money, I would much rather it be me that lends them the money, or right. if I need to borrow money, I would much rather borrow it from one of them as opposed to having to go to some traditional finance institution where they put me under heavy heavy scrutiny because they don't know me and then um, that scrutiny results in either a no or a yes but that yes comes with excessive interest rate 
and then once that interest rate is paid out it goes to that institution and that institution uses it to figure out how they can squeeze more money from if not me you know the economy that 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 we coexist within mm -hmm. rather than that being the case rather than having that as your only option I propose an alternative um, one in which uh, you borrow from the people that know you best um, they they have a, a system to account for how much you owe them they have um, all of the loans uh, you know will have the option to be collateralized against assets and so if if uh, if they want to um, see to it that you service your loans uh, they can do that by requiring collateral or they could say hey you know I know you I know you're good for it I'll loan you the money without any collateral that flexibility that you can have when you have a you know uh, a connection with the person that you're doing business with that's what I want to exist and that currently doesn't exist when you go to big institutions. It can exist because the people who have the decision-making capacity, the power to make those decisions as to whether or not you get approved. Those people don't know you from a can of paint. They can't know everybody because they often service too many people to know everybody. Um, and so um, I reject that, that as the only lending model. The way in which I demonstrate my rejection of that is to build uh, the alternative, which is what personal DAO is. And yeah, and I think that really speaks to the beauty of uh, Web3, DAOs, and decentralized finance, which I think all those things all together are great. Um, and it's piqued my interest a lot because I wrote a book about uh, decentralized finance, and uh, we've had a chance to talk about that.